Good morning, everyone, and just like Dave, I'm so pleased to be here because I get to see people from San Diego that I only see when I go to Orange County. So it's a little bit weird, but a really nice opportunity to spend some time with folks I like spending time with and talk about the kind of things that excite me and, and really make me passionate about what I do. Like Dave, I was sort of given an awesome job a few weeks ago, and it was, hey, we're just going to make you be in charge of a little panel. And if you could deal with, I don't know, environmental effects and human impacts on marine mammals, you've got half an hour to introduce a topic and then 10 minutes to go over it. That should be good, right? <laughs> I was a little bit scared. So um, just like Dave, I really want you to know that this topic isn't my topic. It is the topic of the panel that's going to be in the working group later on today. And just as earlier today, what I'd like to do is to actually present sort of an outline or the way I'd like you to think about these sort of topics, but I thought I'd put a twist on it. And the reason I thought I'd put a twist on it is because my doctor title doesn't come from a PhD. It actually comes from a doctor of veterinary medicine degree. So I look at the world of marine mammals slightly <coughs> different from a lot of folks here, but I deal with the same kind of questions and concerns that you deal with. So with that said, <coughs> Well, I wouldn't want to do that. Can someone help me? Okay, now I'm going to be. I wanted to sort of set a foundation. And I think this cartoon is funny because all cartoons are fun that are funny have a little element of truth. <laughs> and the element of truth that's in here <laughs> is that when we deal with marine mammals, things are never simple. And when we look at things like environmental impacts and human interaction type impacts, things are not simple either. So I sat down and I said, okay, what do we have to look at? I think someone may need to teach me how to use this clicker. Um, how are we going to address these topics? So just like Dave, I sat down and I said, okay, what's our panel made of and how long is it going to take us to sort of get this information together and out? So I made kind of an outline of what we we're going to deal with and I said, okay, Global climate change and variability. We could probably introduce that topic in, I don't know, maybe two hours. And if Al Gore did it, it would be four, but uh -huh. there would be great graphs. So, so let's say we did that in two hours. And then contaminants, that'd probably be another, I don't know, two or three hours. And human interactions, we could maybe take care of that in an hour or so. And we could introduce acoustic concerns, things like ocean noise and sonar, well, three, four hours for the introduction, okay? Um, and then if we look at strandings, well, we've got West Coast, we've got the, the things we learned from strandings, that's probably another two, three hours. And then if we took the medical part and population health, well, that's vet stuff. We could probably do that in 15 minutes or so. So my problem is I said, okay, as long as I've got 15 hours for this introduction, we are there. <laughs> Given that we don't have 15 hours, what I thought we'd do is just sort of take a look at what we're gonna talk about in the working group and then what I'd like to do is to give you a little bit of the doctor perspective on these topics that we're going to talk about this afternoon. Does that make sense? Does it sound worthwhile? Okay, I'm glad you're saying yes, because if you said no, I was about to leave. Um, but what's important is we've got a variety of experts all addressing their areas of really significant importance. So Danielle Palacios, Danielle, are you in? There you are, my friend. Um, He's going to take on, he's got 10 minutes, he's going to go over all the, you know, global warming issues, climate change, he's going to talk very quickly, right? Um, he's, he's like, move along, Missy. Okay. Um, beyond Danielle, we need to talk about contaminants. So we've got Keith Moroya here, and Keith is going to talk about not only contaminants, but he's going to take a look at what are we learning from the contaminant levels that we're determining. We've got... Ann Bowles, who's going to try to address some of the ocean noise and sound type questions that we have. And we've got Sarah Wilkins, who's going to talk about the stranding network and what we're learning from the stranding network and what the stranding network is doing and has done on the west coast of the U.S. And lastly, you've got me, this nutty vet from SeaWorld, who's going to talk a little bit about sort of the health perspectives on things. And what I'd like to do is now address some of the topics from our working group by showing you some funky vet stuff. And I'm going to warn everyone, if you just had breakfast, there's going to be some gooey vet stuff. But I actually think it's the cool part of what I do, so I hope that you can relate to it. So when we talk about what a vet does with marine mammals, the number one thing is 
it's animal health based. So it's, it's a hands on, you touch an animal when you're doing medical type assessments or evaluations. But vets deal with all sorts of marine mammals. Some, some vets just free ranging, some just stranded, some captive, and some vets deal with all those sorts of marine mammals. But what we do with those animals is we actually use comparative medicine to evaluate them in a variety of different ways. So we'll look at everything from infectious diseases to how toxicology is impacting them. And then we look at them not only as individuals, but as part of a group, doing things like epidemiology and disease ecology. Now, the role of vets in evaluating human and environmental impacts is really sort of the role of a juggler. Because what we have to do is take a number of different tests and sort of evaluate what we see in an animal, and then say, what does that mean for how this animal was impacted or ended up that way to begin with? So what I'd like to do is show you some of these modalities and take a look at what they mean for environmental challenges or human impacts. This would be so much better if I knew how to use the clicker. <coughs> Many folks don't actually realize what the heck SeaWorld's doing working with wildlife. And they say, you know, what are you talking about? You're, you know, taking care of Shamu. SeaWorld is actually a lot more than just taking care of Shamu. We've got three parks, California, Texas, and Orlando, Florida. And each of these parks has a large complete diagnostic lab. Of course, we're involved in in-depth management and medicine of the animals in the collection, but why waste a resource like that? So the SeaWorld veterinary team really focuses not only on animals in the collection, but in a lot of wildlife collaborators that really extend throughout the world. Indeed, there's an organization of veterinarians committed to aquatic animal medicine. We're all part of that group. We do all sorts of things with that group. And additionally, all of the SeaWorld parks are part of their local stranding network. So it's more than just Shamu. I have the neat advantage in that I work with all of the parks and all the veterinarians because my role is really sort of one step more than just we got a blood sample. It's now that we got the blood sample, what does this mean in the big picture of things? So I spend a lot of time sort of backing up the folks who do the hands-on work. <coughs> Some of the work we do goes from doing things with manatees in Florida, that's Dr. Laura Croft in Florida. Most of the folks here in Southern California, I think, are familiar with the work we do with pinnipeds. And then we also work with cetaceans, turtles, and seabirds in all the different parks. So that's kind of why the heck I have any knowledge about what's happening with wildlife populations. Well, what sort of things do we learn from these populations? Well, one of the things that's important is what's happening in the environment. Um, I always want to know what's the food availability for these animals. When we have El Nino seasons, we end up with a mess of elephant seals like these little pups. They're just starving, hungry pups, and it's because they have reduced prey availability. But when we're looking at things like prey availability, certainly climatic conditions are important. So as a veterinarian, I can say, these guys are skinny. But I need the biologists and the folks looking at what's happening in the ocean to say why these animals are skinny. Now, unfortunately, when we talk about human interaction, through the stranding network, we deal with a lot of animals that are impacted by malicious human actions. That dog was affectionately called Gaff Dog because we're not clever enough to come up with Project X. Um, he's a dog that was impaled with a gaff, and he actually took three to four days for us to be able to capture, to remove the gaff, and then treat and release that animal. But we are sort of monitoring not only what's happening with individuals, but what are we seeing in sea lion populations with malicious interactions? This has been a problem in Central California for much longer than it has been in San Diego, but we do see animals, these are radiographs of animals that have been shot. And so what you see there, the dark white areas are bullets or bullet fragments in these animals. And those are a concern to us because we want to see how people are interacting with marine mammals. I do a lot of work with folks from the East Coast. And we've got a hub, SeaWorld Research Institute on the East Coast, that does a tremendous job doing cetacean stranding response. These, unfortunately, are the insides of bottlenose dolphins that are coastal animals or animals from the Indian River Lagoon. And you can see the animal on the left has just a stomach full of plastic debris. And the animal on the right, I have to admit, he didn't eat the measuring tape. It's in there for scale. But he's got everything from a snack bag to a shopping bag to pieces of a t-shirt and beach towels. This is important because when we talk about coastal dolphin populations, I want to know how much human debris they're being exposed to and isn't impacting these populations. When we talk about debris impacting populations, I actually think an area that California is most exciting about is line and entanglement issues. These are all, again, cetaceans from Florida. That's the goose beak or the larynx of a dolphin. 
and the line actually cut through the gooseberry. <coughs> now imagine you're a dolphin feeding underwater, and you've got a hole in your respiratory tract, so when you open up your esophagus to swallow, guess what happens? You swallow water. That's really not a good way to live, and it's a bad way to die. There's another little kid who had line both wrapped around his neck. That didn't kill it, but when you've got line that's going from the gape of your mouth, again, it's hard to eat. And lastly, this guy had so much line wrapped around his flukes that he was impaired with swimming. Now, why do I say this is exciting? Well, this is exciting because identifying line and entanglement issues is not hard, but doing something about them is, and that's what I'm hoping our working group can talk about this afternoon. So here in California, we've got sea lions that are entangled. This came off a gray whale a few months ago. But what's important is, in California, we have this fantastic sort of next step. We took these sort of cases, and one of the students at UC Davis did kind of an overview of what's happening with gear-related entanglements. And from that, we've actually got the California Lost Fish and Gear Recovery Program. This is a great program out of the Sea Doc Society. That's Kristen Gallardi, who's one of the go-to people for this program. But this program, in collaboration with lots of different organizations, is involved in removing derelict gear off the shores and in the sea off of California and the west coast of the US. So when we document the problem, when we identify the significance of the problem, we can make a difference. And that's kind of what I'd like our focus to be on this afternoon. Not just what do we see, but what do we do about it? Now, I want to sort of take a little shift and we'll go through a few things quickly because this is the vet perspective on things but I'd like you to see the vet perspective because it so fits into what the biologist can do in conjunction or collaboration with the veterinarians. So what I'd like to do is to look at endemic concerns. In other words, health issues that are in the population, but where environmental impacts makes a difference in those diseases. I want to take a look at diseases that transfer from the land to the sea, or that we used to think simply went from the land to the sea and diseases that go from the sea to the land. And those are either zoonotic diseases, things we could catch in our stranding network, or threats to terrestrial animals. So if we take a look at these, let's start with leptospirosis. Leptospirosis, how many people know this one? Okay, how fun is that? He's got like a fan club, this little guy. Um, this is the kidney of a California sea lion. And you'll have to trust me, if you haven't seen a California kidney, a California sea lion kidney previously, it should have a whole bunch of little red balls that come together to make the multi-radiculate kidney of a sea lion. Okay? And if you look at this kidney, you can see the little red balls all have sort of a thick white outline. Well, that thick white outline is actually inflammation. He's got tremendous inflammation in his kidney, and in truth, there's enough replacement of the normal tissue there to shut things down. And that inflammation is in response to a leptospiral infection. Okay. So I can tell you that when stranded sea lions come in, we can diagnose leptospirosis as the cause of death. Well, what does that mean to the population? Because identifying it in an individual is interesting, but it's not going to get us very far. Well, what's important about the population is we had a wonderful person do a study of the seroprevalence. In other words, she looked at the immune response to this infection up and down the state of California. And what was found was this infection's endemic in the population, and it cycles over time. So you can see we've got seroprevalence, the immune response, over time against a 10-year period. So we expect to see this cyclic presentation of this disease. Okay, why is that important? Well, it's important for two reasons. We need to know the cyclic nature so that if we've got a larger number of cases and we're where we should be in the cycle, that makes sense. But if we should be down low with few cases and we have lots, then something has perturbed our normal cycle. And that indicates, hey, we may have environmental impacts that are changing how this disease cycles through the population. So we don't need to know just what the disease is. We also need to know how prevalent it should be and what to expect over periods of time to know if it's sort of doing what it should do in the population and to start looking for other factors that might be playing a part. Make sense? All righty. Let's take a look at a different concern. Nothing I like better than pus in the morning. Um, there's a neat bacterial infection uh, caused by a bacteria called Streptococcus. Okay, and you can imagine with a name like Streptococcus, what kind of species would you expect to see this in? Seals. What the heck? What's neat is 
We see this organism normally in the normal flora of seals, sea lions, and sea otters. So we know there are a lot of pinnipeds and otters that should have this bacteria normally. And there's bacteria that you and I have, and maybe one day we have a bad day and our immune system's down a little bit and it makes us sick, okay? And sadly, that's what's happened to these guys. Uh-oh, I feel very high tech now. This guy, this is the chest of a young sea lion, and unfortunately, this fluid is essentially just pus, okay? So he's got what we call a pyothorax. And you can imagine, it's hard to breathe when your chest is full of that. These are the kidneys of another sea lion, and this guy is actually septic, so he's got tremendous abscesses present within his kidneys. Now, it's never good news when an animal dies. But when these animals die as sort of one-off, I had a bad day, an infection I wish didn't take hold did, that's okay. But when we see these kind of infections impacting more than one, in other words, impacting large numbers of animals, it means something very different. And oftentimes what it means is we have cofactors. And those cofactors can be a variety of different things. And that's where environmental impacts are important because Streptococcus is a kind of bacteria that's been associated with unusual mortality events in South Africa in starving sea lions and in Europe associated with more bilivirus infections. So we need to take what we find and put it in perspective. Is it one animal? Is it many animals? And what do we expect to see normally? Let's bring it back home. If any of you are involved in California sea lions or the stranding networks, certainly you've seen or heard about these urogenital carcinomas that we have in animals <coughs> associated with the gamma herpes virus. Well, these are, again, kidneys. It's sort of kidney day. Here we have the uterus of an adult female animal. And here we have these big masses. And those are those carcinomas within the abdomen of the sea lion. But what's important is just having this virus, this gamma herpes virus, <coughs> is usually not considered enough to cause this neoplastic concern. We need other factors. We need some promoters. And some of those promoters we need have to do with the genetics of the animal and the presence of some persistent organopollutants. So what's important is this ties in what we're going to talk with about genetics, and it sort of speaks to some of the pollutants and contaminants that these animals are exposed to. The more we know about those cofactors contributing, the more we can sort of have a sense of what's happening with this infection in particular. I actually think if there's one sort of medical concern that could really approach everyone in the room with something to add to teach us more about what's going on, it's this condition in and of itself. Okay. I want to just give a quick sort of vet's perspective so you can see how we look at things. Because I think vets kind of look at things funny. All right, I know we do. But what's important is let's look at some things we thought we knew and we were perhaps wrong. And in that, what I mean is let's look at some protozoal diseases that we thought were really simple. So this is the muscle from a California sea lion. And this is sort of a nod to the stranding network. You can see this is from the Marine Mammal Center in Sausalito. And I think I've got a couple pictures in here from their facility. And in the muscle, can you appreciate these white streaks? Those white streaks are associated with little protozoal cysts present in the muscle, all right? And those protozoal cysts are uh, an organism called sarcocystis. Now, what's important about sarcocystis is typically we say, hey, if you've got that infection, you've got exposed to fecal material from these guys. Well, what the heck are those guys? Possums. How many of you have ever seen a possum swimming in the ocean? <laughs> All right, you go way up. <laughs> What's important is, hmm, it's kind of funky, because we have these sarcocystis infections, and they're impacting marine mammals. Now you say pinnipeds. But they're on the beach. That's how they're exposed to possums. You know, I'm trying to get clever with this. But down here, We've got hepatic sarcocystis in a striped dolphin. And I'll tell you, there's a fair number of dolphins that have trouble with systemic sarcocystosis. Where are they getting exposed to sarcocystis? Before we do that, let's go to a marine mammal with a protozoa I'm sure you've heard about. <coughs> that guy up there is a California sea otter. And how many of you have heard about toxoplasmosis killing California sea otters? Raise your hand. OK, just about everybody in the room. And if you haven't. Toxoplasmosis kills California sea otters. So now we're all on the same page, right? <laughs> What's important is, for so many years we said, well, all of this is feline toxoplasma. It's coming from cat litter. 
But as investigations into the protozoa and marine mammals are growing, what we're finding is it's probably not that simple. And it probably isn't that sarcocystis only comes from possums. And it probably isn't that toxoplasma only comes from cats. We probably have reservoirs within marine mammals. How many people knew that? I could have raised my hand not too long ago for that statement as well. I didn't know that. But what's important is we need to be investigating individuals and then expand what we learn from those individuals into populations. And we, when we talk about collaboration, as a veterinarian, I can't do the genotyping of the protozoa to say which kind of protozoa it is. But if we work with some of the top protozoologists within the US, we can actually work sort of as a group and put together these stories to say, here's what's happening with marine mammals and protozoa. Here's some neat information. The neat thing is, when you look back, you're always smarter than when you're looking forward, right? So this is just toxoplasmosis, impacts uh, cetaceans, as well as pinnipeds. So we've got another one of these protozoa that's impacting dolphins as well as, as seals and sea lions. But let's look at a paper that was done back in 2003. So it was a while ago. And this involved the protozoologist J.P. Duby who looked at animals, free-ranging animals, captive animals, <coughs> captive animals that had access to the wild environment. And he said, let's look at otters. And when they looked at otters, they said, wow, these animals have a high likelihood of exposure and their, their immune response to these organisms are about two-thirds or 80%, okay? So now let's look at animals, dolphins, that should have a low likelihood of exposure, my god. Look how high their immune response is. Well, when we look back now, this was done in 2003, and the question was, well, somehow they're getting exposed to these, you know, it's a land-to-sea transfer. The point of talking about these problems is, as we get smarter, we learn there's so much more to learn. Because this probably does have some degree of land-to-sea transfer, but especially in the cetaceans, it probably has more of a marine environment that we never even knew about. So we need to be open to learning more over time and looking back at results and saying, hey, now we sort of know what that means. This is the cool thing about being a vet. Every once in a while, I get to sneak into UCSD at night and use expensive equipment. <laughs> Shh, don't put that on the internet. <laughs> What's important is, um, as part of the stranding network, we do work with clinical live animals. And this is a common dolphin who came in and it was demonstrating neurologic disease. And so what we're doing with this animal right now is it's in the coil to get an MR image done. Um, and so it's up at UCSD getting an MR exam. What we found when we looked at the brain of this animal, these are slices through the brain sort of like this. Okay, the animal's perfectly alive, promised, didn't hurt him at all to take these images. Um, if you look at the large, <coughs> sort of dark spaces here. These are spaces of fluid within the brain. These are the ventricular canals, okay? They're hard to see here. Here, they're huge, okay? It looks like a big, sad face here. So we've got kind of a little heart and a Y, and then we're starting to get face type things. You never need to have seen a brain before to know, hey, that looks funny. And if I tell you that the volume of these ventricles is almost 60 mLs, but that the normal volume of the ventricles of a common dolphin, be it short, short or long beak, should be around 5 mLs. What would your diagnosis of this be? Hydrocephalus, right? He's got water on his brain. He's got a lot of water on his brain. The question is, what the heck causes hydrocephalus in dolphins off the west coast of the US? Well, one of the things we know that does it is brucellosis, or brucella CD. And what's important about that is, we talked about cases where we thought we knew about the land to sea transfer. Now let's look at this infection where we thought we knew about the sea to land transfer, but it's different. And what's different about it is that Brucella is a zoonotic concern. So it's a disease where carrier eye could pick up this infection from working with this animal. But that may not be the end of the story. And this is where sort of looking at environmental changes via the findings we have in medicine is really important. This is from, these pictures are not mine, they're from a emerging infectious disease paper where they looked at three patients that had um, neurobrucellosis, so these are the brains of people, and these are granulomatous, these are inflammatory <coughs> lesions in the brains of people associated with brucellosis from brucella CT, okay? 
And you would say, oh, clearly they were all necropsying dolphins and that's how they got exposed to this agent. But unfortunately, that's not true. And not only is it not true, one of them had no association they could determine at all with marine mammals. So remember with the protozoa, we thought we knew where it was and how it got to where it was and who it was impacting, but now we're learning it's not that simple. It's likely that the same thing is happening with marine mammals. Some of this is because we're changing how we interact with the ocean environment. As the human population expands, we are more exposed to different environments that we weren't, say, 50 or 100 years ago. But we also need to make sure that we don't look at the world as so simplistic. So there are lots of factors that are interrelated. And as they sort of come together, we get findings like this, and we need to put them in perspective. Lastly, I want to bring things home just for a minute and talk a little bit about toxins and contaminants. And I'm going to focus on toxins because we're going to talk a fair bit about contaminants later on this afternoon. And I think most folks here are familiar with tomoic acid intoxication in, in all sorts of marine mammals off our coast. What's important is tomoic acid is a product of Pseudonychia australis, and it's a glutamate agonist. So this toxin binds to the glutamate receptors, and it causes neurologic disease. And these sea lions are not funking out to the beetles. What they're doing is they're almost comatose. And they're sort of just standing there with their heads up. And sadly, I could easily walk in to this pen with any of these animals and touch them, and they wouldn't respond whatsoever. And they wouldn't respond because they're really out of it. And they're out of it because they've got inflammation in their brain from the intoxication with demoic acid. Now, what's important is we know about demoic acid intoxication, but we have a lot of other questions. So let's look at what it's doing in the animals. In the animals, if I want to diagnose tomoic acid intoxication, I can look at the brain, and in the upper left, what we see is sort of a chronic impact of tomoic acid intoxication. That's the hippocampus, it's part of the brain, and on the right, you can see it's much smaller than the left. You're not going to make that piece of brain back. So this animal isn't impacted just today, or just for a month, that animal's impacted forever. And this is important because we don't know what tomoic acid is doing to sea lion populations as a long-term consequence of these repeated episodes. When we talk about long-term consequences, on the upper right is the heart of an animal. Can you appreciate that we've got a panel area here in the myocardium? Now, I don't know how many of you have, have done enough sort of internet looking to find out what it's like when you've got a pal area of your heart, but I'll give you a hint, it's bad. And it's bad because that's an area where the heart's been damaged by the demoic acid binding to the glutamate receptors of the heart. And lastly, the folks up in Sausalito again are looking at causes of stillbirth and abortion in sea lions associated with demoic acid. We know that this amniotic sac is filled with demoic acid that is sort of partitioned from the mom's blood into the fluid around the baby. <coughs> so when we talk about demoic acid, we've got a lot of recurrent events that are happening all up and down the coast, and many marine mammal species are being impacted. From a veterinary perspective, there's lots of different ways for me to get samples to evaluate. There's lots of lesions I can look at to say, here's what's happening in the individual. We can evaluate for the presence of this organism in the environment, but there's so much more we need to do. That's sort of the working group starting point. What do we have? What I'd like to do is maybe take the working group one step further and say, what are we doing to sort of evaluate why these demoic acid blooms are happening, these Pseudonychia blooms are happening, and what do we sort of know about them? And I think, actually, if we go, these are the kind of questions we need to look at. What's happening with bloom frequency? Is it always the same animal species causing these toxic blooms, or do we have different ones? And what factors are promoting these blooms? The kind of things we need to look at is, if we have an animal bloom, are there factors that are promoting toxin production? And lastly, what are the species that are impacted? Down here, these are not, thankfully, from California, but sadly, if you're in the Florida panhandle, that's where they are from. This is a case of brevitoxicosis in Florida. So every region has its own sort of biotoxin concern, but none of them are good, and none of them do we know enough about. Let's go one step further and sort of give a shout out to the folks up in Santa Cruz doing work with otters. And it's neat, we talk about open source information. This is a, an article from PLOS One that came out just the end of last year. And what's important is the folks that do the otter investigations were noticing that they had a lot of otters, and when they looked at them, they were yellow. Okay, These otters that had died 
were jaundiced or ictric. And they said, wow, that's funky. And when they looked at the livers, this is a normal looking liver, and this is what the liver of the affected animals looked like. And if we look under the microscope, it's very disorganized, there's damage to the liver, and they say, wow, that's really weird. You know, I don't know a, a marine infectious agent or toxic condition or something that would cause this. What's going on? The reason I like to sort of highlight the otter story is there's a freshwater biotoxin called microcystin. And you think, what the heck are sea otters doing intoxicated with microcystin? Well, what they're finding is the world's very interconnected. Crazy, huh? Okay. And unfortunately, freshwater blooms can get to the ocean environment. And when you've got a coastal marine mammal inhabitant, they can be impacted by these toxins associated with freshwater blooms. We need to be open to experiencing, investigating, and sort of realizing that there are problems we haven't noticed before, or that perhaps didn't happen before, but we need to be open to say, hey, there's new stuff that can happen every day. Okay. Lastly, I just want to hit a little bit about the fact that we need to consider contaminants, because when we're looking at human impacts, certainly contaminants are of very high significance. And that's not just you know things like organochlorines. We've got a variety of endocrine disruptors, dioxins, petrochemicals, and heavy metals. There's a whole scope of sort of contaminants, chemical contaminants that are of concern. This is my shout out for the importance of stranding networks. Who knows what this guy up here is? Ann Bowles, you may not speak. <laughs> this is from, again, the Hubs SeaWorld Research Institute folks in Florida, and it's Cogia bremsa. And what's important is, this is a very difficult species to investigate. Cogidae, in general, are really hard to identify when they're free swimming. And much of what we know about these animals actually comes from stranded animals. The folks at the Institute in Florida have been uh, working with these animals from a stranded animal perspective for a number of years now. And I actually would say that much of what we know about them specifically relates to samples that come from the stranded animal populations. Now, I won't lie, it probably isn't the perfect representative of the whole population. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. But it's a pretty good start. And in the grand scheme of a good start, they said, hey, let's look at heavy metals in these guys. And what they found was heavy metal changes over the age of the animal or related to the sex of the animal aren't the same as either the, the normal tertiops values that we have or even the pinniped values that we have, but they're also not the same as what we've seen in the baleen whales that have been evaluated either. So koji are different. And the only way we know is by looking at these stranded animals because it's so hard to see the free swimming animals in the wild. We need to be clever in evaluating human impacts because there's more than one way to sort of evaluate a concern. Sort of my bottom line for this, and what my hope for this afternoon is, is that we'll all take a look at the fact that if we use the animal as kind of the driving engine, that population health is sort of a critical monitor, not just of what's happening to one animal or even a population, but to the ocean environment and what we're doing with human impacts. So this afternoon, clearly, we'll take a look at those special features each in much more depth. But I hope that by the weird vet perspective, you've looked at things perhaps a little differently, but you can see how looking at individual animals can really give you a perspective on what's happening in the environment. That's it. See you this afternoon.